Good evening, folks. Thank you again for letting me into your home. Thank you for choosing to, uh, to tune in and uh, be, be present for this study. I hope you're enjoying the study. Man, I am, I don't know whether it's because I'm a short timer or what, but I'm enjoying this study probably as much as any, if not maybe more, than any that I have ever done. Even when I was attending Liberty, uh, at least going through the Lussell program at Liberty back uh, uh, when I had just recently retired and was in my 50s. Uh, I, I loved that and enjoyed that. But it looked like to me this is, uh, I'm just absorbing this and it's rich in, uh, in what it's saying. And it seems like to me it is rich for me. And uh, uh, I'm ho- I hope it is for you as well. Let's pray as we prepare to start. Father, thank you again for our time together today. Thank you for... Uh, for loving us as you do. Uh, thank you, Jesus, for, uh, for taking the blame for my sins and yet uh, continuing to love me when I continue to do things that uh, I know is not pleasing with you. So, Father, forgive me. Uh, and again, thank you for, for letting your Son, Jesus Christ, come and die in my place. My goodness, what a thought. What a thought. So, as we continue to study in this book of Mark, uh, may we allow it to, to touch our hearts. May we allow the words to, uh, to uh, protrude into our ear and then down into our hearts that we might be better men and women for the very glory of God. Your will be done today, uh, tonight. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Okay, so if you have people uh, that you want to mention, you mention those uh, right now, and again, Jane, you and Ken, you uh, share the missionaries if you haven't already, uh, and then we will, uh, we will have a prayer for those, and then we'll move right on into our study. Father, thank you for those that have been mentioned, for those that are seeking salvation, and I know, uh, I know that they are, unless you have worked miracles, and I haven't heard about it yet, but God, I know you're in the miracle working business. I know that you came to seek and to save that which was lost. So I know whenever we offer up those names that are seeking or need salvation, we know that that's exactly why you came. Thank you for coming, uh, as you did, for them that has a need and for those of us that continues to have a need as well. I pray for the missionaries. Thank you, Father, for those that, that have given their lives, given their lives to serve. Uh, in a foreign country, and those that are home missionaries as well. But we just lift them up to you. Thank you, Father, for the fact that they have been called to go, and we have been called to make sure that they get to go and to stay as long as your hand's upon them. In Christ's name I pray, amen. Okay, so we're moving into, uh, into the fifth chapter of Mark. We've moved very, very slow. I hope you're okay with that. Uh, we move very, very slow, and we're moving into, uh, into the very fifth chapter uh, of Mark. And remember, this is John Mark. It's one that went on the first missionary journey uh, with Paul and Silas, and somehow, somewhere during that journey, he gave up and came home, and the second missionary journey, uh, Paul and Silas had a little difficulties over where to take him or not. Paul uh, didn't want to take him. Uh, Silas did want to take him, and of course they are not split. I don't like that word. They divided and, and went in two different, uh, two different mission fields at that time. But somewhere later in life, uh, Paul and John uh, somehow got not reacquainted, but John, uh, 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 John Mark began to uh, be of great help to Paul, whether through prayer or visiting or whatever, uh, and then he mentioned them in his latter books as, as, as he read. Now, this is Mark's book. It's not Paul's writing. It's Mark's writing. And uh, so let's get right on into the fifth chapter. Now, we just completed the fourth chapter uh, of Mark, uh, and, and we find within that, the, that fourth chapter that there was evidence of Jesus being master over nature. It was there that he calmed the storm of the frightened disciples and then uh, made them realize that, hey, this man is different from any that we have ever 
been around or ever met. And indeed he was. Indeed he was, because not only uh, was he the Son of God, he became the Lamb of God uh, and, and gave his, his life on a cross for not only the disciples, but for you and I as well today here in this 20th century. So we find in the fourth chapter the closing with Jesus exhibiting or showing or, or using his power over nature. Peace, he said, be still. And now as we open up the very fifth chapter, we are finding him uh, in, 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 in this chapter uh, as, as having power over the demonistic spirits. So uh, the demon spirits uh, are, are, are powerless against the power of an awesome God that is demonstrated through the person of Jesus Christ. So let's begin reading and just do again a verse by first verse by verse study, uh, chapter five, and they came over unto the other side of the sea uh, into the country of the Gadarenes. Now, let me just talk about that sea a little bit. Uh, they, uh, they had come across the, uh, the Sea of Galilee. Uh, they had encountered the storm, and now they'd gotten to the other side, and and uh, Jesus stepped off of, off of the boat again uh, onto land. Now, this was the, uh, was the city of Gadarene. Now, Gad was one of Israel's sons. So this was the area that was given to, to Gad uh, on, uh, on this side of Jordan, and the other ten tribes, two tribes stayed on this side, and the other ten tribes went on the other side into the promised land where God had promised them, uh, and Gad was allowed to stay on, on, on this side. Uh, some say uh, that even uh, that's where he ran into his sin problem, was he didn't go as far as God had challenged them to go. Let me remind you of something right here. When God had promised Israel the promised land, he promised them the promised land. Now, they had a right to go into the promised land, or they had a right to stay where they were. And, and Gad and another tribe uh, stayed where they, where they were on this side uh, of, the, of the Jordan River. Now, uh, and then verse 2, And when he was come out of the ship, now he's still calling it a ship, a boat and a ship. When he had come out of the ship, uh, there, when he had come out of the ship immediately, now I want us to focus on that immediately a minute. When Jesus had landed on the other side of the Jordan, and this was Gentile territory, why? Because they were pig farmers. They were pig farmers. We'll get to that. Uh, uh, and, and, and when he had got off of the boat, uh, the scripture tells us immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. And when he had come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. Now the tombs wasn't a nice place to live. Uh, nobody lives there now. The bodies are there. The saints are living in the presence of God. We know that. So uh, it is just the bodies there. The bodies, the bodies are dead because the Spirit has left them. The Spirit has left them. And then verse 3. Who had his dwellings among the tombs, and no man could bind him, no, not with chains. Now we find out that this uh, this demon-possessed man had supernatural powers. He had powers that he couldn't be tamed, he couldn't be chained, he couldn't be fettered. Now, the fetters that we talk about, uh, I am told, was some kind of a foot brace. 
made out of chains as well. So this man just couldn't be tamed. He was he was a a a uh, uh, he was a nuisance to others that are around. Matter of fact, one writer called him called him uh, a manic, a manic maniac. I'm sorry, maniac. Uh, we used to use those words back home uh, when we were growing up, you know, with eight kids and mom and dad. And sometimes, uh, sometimes uh, that word would come up. And when we were kidding with each other, and sometimes we were doing more than kidding uh, each other. You are a maniac. And uh, I could never spell the word, matter of fact. So uh, I thought I knew what the meaning was. It wasn't a nice name. It wasn't a nice word. Uh, but but we we use that. This man was described by uh, some of the commentaries that I study uh, that a man, maniac. And uh, uh, so we we go on with that verse. We're going somewhere with this. Who had his dwellings among the tombs, uh, and no man could bind him. Uh, no, not with chains. Verse four, because that he had. Uh, been often bound with, uh, with had been often bound with fetters. That is a foot brace of chains and chains. That's wrapped the old big chain around him, uh, and the chains had been plucked asunder. Now I don't know how he may have done that. Maybe he just pushed his muscles out or whatever. Uh, I don't know how he done that. Uh, but what we're going to find out here that these legions that he, he, he called himself are uh, the demons that was in him. Now, there were two people there with the demons inside a real man, a real person. We're going to focus on that uh, just a little bit a little later on. Uh, he'd been often bound with chains and, and, uh, and fetters, and yet he would burst them asunder, uh, broke the chains into pieces, and neither could any man tame him. Now, verse 5, always day and night. Seems like he didn't do very much sleeping. He was always raising Cain, if you will. That's an old Holostonian word. He was always uh, hollering, yelling, disturbing. And, uh, and, and, and he, he uh, uh, and always day and night, or night and day, the King James, uh, verse 5, uh, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with thunder. Now, during my tenure here as pastor, 50 years, coming up next month, I've had people within this church that cut themselves. Now, why they did that, I don't know. Sometimes uh, we feel that they're doing it for attention. I I, I, I finally had to accept the fact that it wasn't that. It was something, it was something beyond that. Now, do I mean they were demon possessed? Not at all. Not at all. But what I'm saying is that we have had people right inside this facility, this campus, that had done that as well. Verse 4, because uh, they had been often bound with fetters and chains, uh, the chains had been plucked asunder, uh, and the fetters uh, torn to pieces. And then verse 5, and always day and night, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, carrying, crying, and cutting himself with stones. Now, this first five verses are identifying, well, the first verse of Jesus arriving at this uh, gathering. Uh, place. And then the next four verses kindly identifies what met him there. What met him there. Now, verse 6, and, and when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him. Now, Vernon McGee, I do a lot of referencing him. Vernon McGee's commentary said this man was kind of like we call people sometimes uh, split personalities. And what Vernon McGee was talking about was 
there was the man, the real man there, and then there was the demons that was possessing the real man. And uh, he stated that sometimes uh, the man would be talking and sometimes the demons would be talking. I don't know enough about, uh, about that to, to challenge him on that. He was a great man of God, and he now he's not teaching, but he's living in the very presence of that awesome God. But when this man saw Jesus, verse 6, when he saw him afar off, when he saw him afar off, he ran to him and he worshipped him. Now, and, and I, I, want, I want to go a little somewhere here. I picked up something as I was studying last night and again and again today. Now, the setting is set, the first, uh, the first five verses. Uh, Jesus is on the land, on this Gentile side uh, of, the, uh, of the Sea of Galilee. And, and the man sees him. And he comes a running to him. Now, here's what I want to ask you. After we have read, uh, well, let me just read them again. Uh, verse 2, And when he was come out of the ship, immediately there came a man out of the tombs, lived in the tombs uh, with an unclean spirit, and uh, who had his dwellings among the tombs, and no man could bind him, uh, no not with chains, uh, because he had been tied before and he had broke the chains and uh, no one was able to, uh, to uh, contain him, even with chains as difficult as they might be to broke. And always day and night, he was in the mountains when he saw Jesus. Let me ask you, what do, what do you see? What, what do you see here when I read uh, the second through the fourth, fifth verses? What do you see? I want to give you just a minute to think about that. I'm not going to give you much time, but I want to give you just a minute. And I hope maybe after this study tonight you will think about that too. What do, you, what do you see when you first see that? Well, I'll tell you what I see. I see a crazy man. Now, I don't mean that other than that's what I see. That's what I see. I see a man that's crazy, and I see a man that I really don't want to have a lot to do with. <clears throat> I really don't want to have a lot to do with this guy, and I will go around rather than go by where he dwells. But let me ask you something. What did Jesus see? What did Jesus see when he saw this lunatic coming at him? Coming at him. What did he see? What Jesus saw. What Jesus saw was a man. He saw a man. In spite of his condition, I'm talking to somebody here. I'm talking to somebody here. He saw a man in spite of his conditions. Now, this man had to be nasty, probably slobbering at the mouth, I don't know. Dirty, probably stinky, probably someone that we want to back off. We want them uh, maybe, uh, you know, to just leave us alone and we'll leave him alone. But Jesus didn't see that. He saw, Jesus saw, let me tell you now, Jesus saw the same person that he saw when he looked at me when I was a sinner. He saw someone that had a soul, that had a heart. He saw someone that needed Jesus. Someone that needed Jesus' help. That's what he saw. That's what he saw. He didn't see a crazy man. He saw a man that needed what he came to bring. 
What did Jesus come to bring? To seek and to save that which was lost. Not seek and to save that which was clean, that which was acceptable, that which didn't stink. That wasn't he came. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. And this man that Mark is talking about needed Jesus. Needed Jesus. Now let me read a little bit more over here. I, 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 I like that. This is a man that has a desperate need. A man possessed with an unclean spirit. A man possessed with an unclean spirit. And the tombs where he lived and stayed around was unclean as well. This is a man that no longer enjoyed society or normal living, or loving agape-style people. He wasn't even allowed to associate with them. He lived in the, uh, in the cemetery. So, what I see in this person is different to what Jesus saw. Now, what challenges me just a little bit is when I realize that Jesus saw in this man the same thing that he saw in me. He saw a sinner that needed the forgiveness and the grace that Jesus came to offer You say, well, Pastor, I, I agree with you as to what Jesus saw, and it was different to what I saw. So let me ask you, how is this going to affect us tonight? How is it what we're doing tonight going to affect us tomorrow? Now let me tell you something. Tomorrow we're going to see some lost people may even see some in our homes tonight. I start to say, may even see some before we get home tonight, but know you're in your homes. So what are we going to see? Are we going to see that person that is, uh, and I'm not, I'm, not, uh, uh, I'm not condoning this, that person that is full of tattoos? Are we going to see that person? Are we going... Uh, to see the person that may be a little dirty or raggedy? Or are we going to see what Jesus saw when he looked at this man? Or what Jesus saw when he looked at you and me? You see, that makes a difference in this whole story, don't it? It should make a difference in our whole life, shouldn't it? And the way that we look at people. And the way that we look at people. So this should remind us that in Jesus' eyes, he don't see the lunatic that's in this man or that's in us. He sees the heart that has a need. Now listen to me. And he sees a need that he can help. Who is it in your life? Who is it in your life that just needs to be smiled at? Who is it in your life and my life that just needs to have somebody to say, how are you doing today? Or say, thank you. Who is it in our lives that needs for us not to walk around this person that we don't particularly like, but walk right by him and say hi, and maybe even when things get back to some kind of normal, pat him on the back or hug him or her. Maybe that's what we need to say. Now, another thing comes up right here. 
that I want to make sure that you know about before we cut the machine off tonight. And that is, could this be what is missing in our lives? To make us feel good about ourselves and about what we have to offer because we have Jesus? Could it be that missing link? That we are always talking about somebody and putting them down rather than seeing them just like Jesus saw us and praying for them and encouraging them wherever we go? That doesn't mean that we accept the sin that is out there. We, can't even, we shouldn't even accept the sin that is in here. But what Jesus saw in this man and in you and I was more than likely when I challenge you to see who you saw, more than likely was just like us. Just like us. Man, I love that. I love that. I love that. Now, let me read on down a little further. We'll pick up a couple other verses here, beginning with the sixth verse. Well, that's when he saw Jesus afar off. Verse 7. And he cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou son of the Most High? Now, here is where J. Vernon talks about the split personality. He said part of this is, is reacting from the man himself that was seeing Jesus running towards him. And then the demons are the ones that said, what have I to do with you? What do you and I have in common? Jesus, thou son of the most high God, I adjourn thee by God that you torment me not. That was a demon speaking. The man ran to God, but he was possessed with demons, and they began to speak. Don't do anything to us. They knew that they deserved something done, being done too. Just like sometimes we think somebody out there needs to deserve something worse than they're getting. We do that. We do that. Don't shake your head, no. We do that too. So let's pick up at verse five, verse 8 now. Verse 8. For he said unto him, now he here being Jesus, this is not the demon-possessed man, nor is it the demons that are possessing the man. For he said unto him, Jesus said unto him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. You see, Jesus sees where our problems are. He saw this man just like a regular man, but he saw what was keeping him from being the man that God created him to be or the woman that God created her to be. So come out of this man you unclean spirits. And he asked him, now Jesus is talking here, he asked him, what's your name? He's talking to the spirits, not the man, according to J. Vernon. What's your name? And he answered and said, my name is Legion, for we are many. Now, Remember back to Mary Magdalene when Jesus uh, was living on earth and doing his ministry, and he met Mary Magdalene one time, and he cast seven demons out of her. Well, now, if we kind of break down what legions, what legions uh, really mean, it is 6,000 soldiers. Now, I'm not saying there were 6,000 demons in this man, not at all. But there were more than one and maybe even more than seven. That was in Murray Magdalene. So 
what's your name? And they, in verse 9, and they reminded him that his name was Legions, for we are many. In verse 10, and he besought him much that he would not send them away out of the country. Now, these are the demons. We like it here. Sin likes it in your life, and my life. He loves that. So, don't send us out of the country, verse 11. Now, there were uh, there nigh the mountains a great herd of swine feeding, swine or hogs. Jews didn't like hogs. They were on the other side of uh, the Galilee, uh, the Sea of Galilee. Now they're on the Gentile side of the Sea of Galilee, so I'm being told through my commentary studies, and they evidently were hog, hog, uh, hog farmers. And they chose to go out of the, 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 the man, the demon-possessed man, and move into the hogs. Now, I, I tell you what, I really got too much to finish here within this session. Let me pick up a couple other verses, and, and uh, uh, I would like to get through the 20th verse of this study. Uh, now, there were there uh, on the mountains a great herd of swine. Uh, verse 12, And all the devils besought him, saying, Send us into the hogs, the swine, that we may enter into them. Verse 13, And forthwith Jesus, Jesus gave them leave. So the spirits honored Jesus. They obeyed Jesus. Jesus not only on the other side of the Sea of Galilee had power over nature, now he's having power over demons. Now these wasn't devils, these were demons. There's one devil. These were demons. And he gave them leave. Okay, if you want to go into the hogs, you go into the hogs. And, and they, they did. They, they uh, fed, they, they, they went into the hogs, and the hogs got so stirred up that they just run violently down the hill and into the sea, and they drowned it. And those that fed the swine saw what was happening, and they went and told the swine owners about what had happened. In verse 15, and they came to Jesus, the, the swine owners, they came to Jesus uh, and, and saw him that was possessed with the devil had, had the, uh, was sitting there clothed and in his right mind. They were afraid. We'd rather had, now this is not written, we'd rather have them in the man than in our swine because that was a financial loss for us. Okay? You know what, folks? Let me remind you. When we write somebody off because of their wickedness, we probably sing the same thing. Let us alone. Let them alone. Leave them where they are. They aren't bothering anybody but themselves. Mm. Well, let's finish that reading, and if we have something to pick up next week uh, in this portion before we move on, we'll do that. Uh, and, and they began to pray him to depart out of their coast. Jesus, please leave us. Jesus, please leave us. Jesus, please leave us. You know, we don't, we don't say that today. We want Jesus to be with us. Maybe except sometimes. We'd rather not. That's whenever we aren't being the child that he came to save us to be. To save us to be. And when he was coming to the ship... He that was possessed with a demon prayed, saying, Let me go with you. And I'm going to spend some time next week on this. It's too much to let go this quickly. Howbeit Jesus saith unto him, Go home. Go home to your friends and tell them what great thing the Lord has done for you and have had compassion on you. 
And the scripture says he departed and began to publish it abroad. You know what I was thinking, and I'm, I probably shouldn't close here, but I am. What I was thinking is whenever we have a person that accepts Christ, whether it be a child or, or a young person or a middle-aged or an older person, I'm wondering if that person has obeyed God unless he goes home and tells whoever's home. Maybe it would be a lost mom and dad. I don't know that I receive Christ today. I'm not saying something else has to be added to salvation. It does not. But I'm saying, have we obeyed the Jesus Christ that chose to leave heaven and come down to us that we might be saved, that we might accept Christ, that we might become a child of God, or are we telling others what great thing has happened in us? When was the last time you, you told somebody what Jesus did in your life? When was the last time I told somebody what Jesus did in my life. Jesus was telling this man, no, you go home. Here is your greatest witness at home and around your friends telling them that how I once was lost, but now I'm saved, was blind, but now I see. Father, thank you again for our time together today, or tonight, in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, folks. Thank you for letting me in your home. I think I have about five more times to come in like we're doing now, uh, loving every, every minute of it. So we will pick up then next week. We will touch on this a little bit more, and then we'll pick up at Jesus healing Jairus' daughter when she wasn't even present. God is good all the time. God bless you. Thank you.